The scripture this morning is from the book of Micah, chapter 5 and verse 2. Will you stand with me as I read this morning? Micah, chapter 5 and verse 2. Reads, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time that we have once again to come freely and openly, lifting up our voices to you in song and praise and to study your word together. And Father, we, we acknowledge that we are sinful creatures, that we are weak, we are fickle and yet you are faithful. We just thank you, Father, for that faithfulness. And we just pray that as we look into your word this morning that we will be strengthened and encouraged by the promises you, that you have given us and especially the promise of a Savior. Father, it's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we ask this prayer. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Once again, the Christmas season is upon us. It's here. You can almost just feel the excitement in the air around us every time this time of year rolls around. I think that's true no matter what age you are during the Christmas season. Um, even though it's a time of a lot of waiting with um, excited expectation. But to pull it off, you see, there has to be preparation. Time was you had to go from store to store to do all your Christmas shopping and you know, you had to deal with the traffic and the crowded stores and the long checkout lines, and now you can sit at home in your sweats and browse the internet and just click to add stuff to a cart that probably already has your credit card in there. So now all you have to do then is just click ship, send, or finish the transaction, or whatever the case may be. Um, there's still an aspect of uh, anticipation and preparation there, though. Uh, and now you have to wait for those things that you've purchased to arrive. And, and then when they get there, you have to open them up and make sure it's actually what you ordered and make sure that it's all in good order. Um, then after that, you gotta wrap the presents and things of that nature. A lot of preparation. For many, there's gonna be gatherings with uh, family and friends that's uh, not all going to be at the same time. So you're going to have several events across this holiday season that you're going to have to prepare for. Preparing the food as well as along with the gifts. So you're going to have multiple times, multiple opportunities, of uh, multiple levels of preparation to pull off multiple events. Really the season is just one long preparation. That's what it comes down to. When you think about it, a lot of things throughout the year are that way. It takes preparation to get ready for the event. It takes preparation to pull, we just came off of Thanksgiving holiday. For most of us, that took some preparation. Coordination of travel for family members, a coordination of lodging for some family members, coordination of the food, who, who's gonna prepare what and bring what, so again, <laughs> Preparation. Really throughout the year, we just have these events, one after another, that we have to prepare. If we're gonna travel somewhere on a vacation, that takes preparation to plan out what you're gonna do on vacation, you know, with a schedule down to the minute. Okay, that's just me, but <laughs> you gotta prepare for the vacation. You gotta fill it, fit it all in. You see, that's my goal. Uh, there's the traveling, if you're gonna go camping, you gotta prepare, maybe it's just a day at the lake. You gotta pack up all the stuff that you're gonna need, going through the mental checklist. Really, if you're just gonna cook a regular meal, you gotta make the plan, you gotta prepare, you gotta make out the grocery list to go to the grocery store to get the stuff. Uh, much of our time here on earth, when you think about it, seems to be spent in preparation. Scripturally speaking, our time here on earth really is just preparation for meeting our Savior, for getting ready to meet our Savior. We're preparing our hearts to be more like our Savior Jesus Christ and helping others along the way as well to prepare to meet Him. We're preparing for eternity while we're here. 
One of the primary points of the Old Testament was to prepare for the coming of Jesus Christ. The first prophecy about a Savior was given in Genesis chapter 3, if you'd like to be turning there. Theologically, this is called the Proto-Evangelium. That comes from two different Greek words. Proto meaning first, and Evangelium meaning good news. The first good news that was presented, right after the account of creation, we have the account of the fall of mankind, of sin entering into the world when Eve took the forbidden fruit and she ate of it because she was tempted by Satan to do, to do so. And then she gave it to her husband, Adam, and he also ate of it. And so God pronounces a curse upon them, but with the pronouncement of the curse due to their disobedience against God, we also have the promise that one day a Savior would come. Genesis chapter 3, let's look at verses 14 and 15. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head, but you shall bruise his heel. This is the first great promise in prophecy. And it's the promise of a Savior that would come. Uh, it shall bruise, it says in the King James, that it's he, that is the seed, will bruise the head. And that seed, of course, is Christ. Um, he, that is Satan or the serpent, shall bruise the heel of the seed that will come. Uh, that's the lower part of the body. It's a non-vital injury. It hurts when you hurt your heel, but it's not a mortal wound. On the other hand, though, Christ, it, the seed, would crush the head of Satan. That's a mortal wound, you see, a crushing destruction. This prophecy states the fact, again, that Satan would bruise Christ's heel, what we now know to be a reference to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And at first, it would appear that Satan had found the victory when that occurs. But it was temporary. Because on the third day, Jesus Christ rose from the dead, defeating the powers of sin and death and hell, and thereby crushing Satan's head. The finished work of redemption the cross of Calvary is he sealed the doom of Satan. We've barely cracked the cover of the book, and man has already disobeyed God. But along with it, God has given the promise of redemption. The promise of a Savior. No quickly does sin enter than God pronounces a remedy for that sin. A Redeemer that would come. The work, the, certain, the work that the serpent began that was expressed through Adam and Eve's conscious choice to sin would one day be crushed through the arrival of the offspring of the woman. That offspring, of course, is the one whom we celebrate at this time of year. It points to the one that Christmas is all about, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the moment of the first sin onward, the entirety of the Old Testament prepares us for and points us toward the great moment of the coming of the Savior, Jesus Christ. When our Savior would come and save us from the curse of sin, and therefore, we have continuing prophecies about that event all throughout the Old Testament. The Mosaic Law and the temple sacrifices actually show us our need for a Savior. That was the point of them. The slavery and the sorrow of the Israelites as they were held in bondage in Egypt pointed to the bondage that we all face because of the fallen nature that's within us. The prophets of the Old Testament looked for and longed for the coming of the Redeemer, the coming of the Savior. 700 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Micah, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, looking forward to his verse, wrote what we read this morning. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. I read it in the New King James. The NIV says, But you... Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come 
for me, one who will be the ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. For those of you who listen to uh, modern, uh, contemporary Christian music, Chris Tomlin has a song out that says, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God incarnate here to dwell, praise his name, Emmanuel the one from ancient times whom Micah wrote about has more than a hundred different names in Scripture. Emmanuel is one of them. God with us. He's also called the Alpha and the Omega, the Word of Life, the Bright Morning Star, the Light of the World, the Great I Am, the Ancient of Days, and many others. But He is Emmanuel, God with us. And when Jesus arrived, he came humbly, quietly, in a small, forgotten town that didn't even have a proper room for the arrival of their king, their Messiah, Jesus Christ. But let's not allow the circumstances in which he chose these prophecies to be fulfilled confuse who this child is. The one who was born of Mary and laid in a manger, he is that ancient one, the creator, the author and the giver of life, the very word of God. For hundreds of years, the prophets looked to him, longed for him, waited for his coming, longing for his rescue, and they wrote about his coming. In Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, we find that the coming Savior would be of the seed of Abraham. In Genesis chapter 21 and verse 12, we find that he would be of the seed of Isaac. In Genesis chapter 28 and verse 14, we further find that he would be of the seed of Jacob. And then in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10, of the 12 sons of Jacob, we find that the Redeemer would come from the tribe of Judah. And then further in Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6, we find that he would be of the lineage of the house of David. And you can go back and look at the lineage as presented in Matthew chapter 1 for the lineage of Jesus and find that he was, in fact, of that very lineage that was pointed out. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David. In Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, we find that then he would be born in Bethlehem which is an amazing prophecy. Because consider also that the week before the birth of Jesus, Mary and Joseph were still in Nazareth. Left to their own, that's where Jesus would have been born. But Caesar made a decree that a census be taken, and each man with his family had to return to his hometown. And for Joseph, Mary's husband, his family roots were in Bethlehem. So they had to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem, a distance of about 80 miles. For them at this time, a hard four days journey, trying to make about 20 miles a day with a very pregnant Mary. And because of the other people that had traveled there, when they got there, the Holiday Inn was full No vacancies. Maybe it wasn't a holiday inn, but there was no room for them at the inn. There was no place for them. And the rest is history, which I'm sure you well know, how that they had to stay in a stable. And Jesus was born there and laid in a manger. But the Old Testament prophecy foreshadowing the coming of Christ said that he would be born in Bethlehem. And the events worked out so that Jesus was not born in Nazareth, but was indeed born in Bethlehem, just as the prophecy had foretold. And much of the Old Testament continues to foreshadow the coming of Christ and to prepare us for his arrival. Prophecy after prophecy is given about him. Prophecies that make it clear who he was so that they would recognize him when he came. Yes, I realize point two was prophecies. I have repeated prophecies on purpose because there is prophecy after prophecy. There are so many that prepared 
the world for the coming of Jesus Christ, the Savior. We don't have time to turn to all of these this morning, but I'm just going to give you just a few. As we've seen that he would be born in Bethlehem, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. That prophecy was given in about 710 B.C. Over 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, it was prophesied that he would be born in Bethlehem, and he was. He would be born to the tribe of Judah, as we saw in Genesis chapter 49. As I mentioned earlier, verse 10, that prophecy was given 1,700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? In Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5, it said that he would be preceded by a forerunner. We know that forerunner to be John the Baptist. But that prophecy was given in about the year 700 B.C. In Daniel chapter 2, it's noted that the Messiah would be born during the rule of the Roman Empire. That prophecy was given in six, around 600 B.C. Also, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31 and verse 15, at about the same time, 600 B.C., it was foretold that there would be grief and sorrow from Herod's killing of infants trying to kill Israel's newborn king. In Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1, it was foretold how that the Messiah and his family would have to flee to Egypt to escape that persecution. That prophecy was given around 740 B.C. 740 years before the birth of Christ. There are prophecies that foretell about the birth of Christ, and there are many others relating to his earthly ministry, such as that he would be able to heal all manner of disease and sickness. That's recorded in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 4, about 700 B.C. is when that was written. That he would teach in parables. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, a prophecy given about 750 B.C., that he would enter into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Riding on a donkey. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, about 500 B.C. That he would be betrayed by a friend. Psalm chapter 41 and verse 9. In one of those messianic psalms, it foretells several things there in that passage about Jesus Christ. But that psalm was written 1,100 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. But it was about Him and His coming and His ministry. Further, in Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13, it's foretold there that He would be betrayed for a price, for 30 pieces of silver. That prophecy rolled out about 500 years before the birth of Christ. Also around the same time that that money would be used to purchase a potter's field. That he would be spat on, mocked, and beaten. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 6, given about 700 B.C. That he would be crucified. Now that's extraordinary. Because death among the Jewish people was to be by what manner prescribed by God? Stoning. They were to be stoned to death when they were put to death. And yet, 1,100 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, in Psalm chapter 22 and verse 16, it was prophesied that the Messiah would in fact be crucified, not stoned to death. Psalm chapter 69 and verse 21, that he would be given vinegar and gall to drink. Psalm chapter 22 and verse 18, that lots would be cast for his garment. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 46, Numbers chapter 9 and verse 12, Psalm chapter 34 and verse 20, all that not a bone of his body would be broken. Prophecy after prophecy after prophecy about Jesus Christ given hundreds of years before his birth that were fulfilled by him. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 53. One of the most famous 
passages about Christ is found there. Let's take a look at it. Isaiah chapter 53, and uh, let's look at verse 1. Starting with verse 1. It says, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As we hid, as it were, our faces from him, he was despised and we did not esteem him. We did not respect him. Of course, it's a prophecy about Jesus Christ and about how he would be rejected and how he would die for our sins. Skip down to verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his his mouth. Skip down to verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he was because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Also, that he would be buried by the rich. Look back at verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked, uh, but with the rich at his death, because he had no, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Uh, this prophecy about the death of Jesus Christ here was given again about seven hundred years before the birth of Jesus Christ. This one is especially hard for the Jewish people to accept because. It prophesies the rejection of Jesus Christ. That the Messiah who would come, their king would suffer, that he would be beaten, that he would be afflicted, that he would be punished, that the sins of all men would be upon him, and that he would be separated from God. The Jews looked for a Messiah who would come and set up a kingdom. One who would come and overthrow Gentile dominion over them. They stumbled at the thought of a king who would come and suffer and be rejected and die a humiliating death of a criminal on a cross with criminals because they didn't understand the concept of original sin. They thought they could be made holy by their practice, but they can't and we can't. You can't. I can't. Someone has to pay the price for our sin. And that's why Christ came to earth, was born of a virgin, took on the form of a human, lived a sinless life, and died on the cross. Because either you pay for your sins by your death and being eternally separated from God because of your sins, or you accept the death of Jesus Christ as payment for your sins on your behalf. That's the bottom line, folks. Either you accept Jesus Christ as your advocate, as your Savior, and all your sins are forgiven because of what He's done on your behalf, or you stand before God on your own merit, and that will not end well, you being your own advocate. And you will be found guilty of your sins and worthy of the punishment which will be being thrown into the lake of fire where you will be separated from God forever and be in eternal torment. And I don't know which torment will be worse, the torment of the fire in the lake of fire or the torment of the knowledge of knowing that you are now forever separated from God. But that choice is yours to make. God won't force it upon you. But I beg you, please, Accept Jesus Christ 
as your Savior. The death of Christ was even foretold in Daniel chapter 9. The date of the death of Christ was foretold in Daniel chapter 9, 9 verses 24 to 26. And that prophecy was given about 550 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Christ didn't just die, though. He rose from the dead, and He ascended to heaven. There are numerous direct prophecies about Jesus. The odds of a person being born who would be able to fulfill prophecies that were made about them hundreds of years in advance is phenomenal. I mean, try just making three prophecies about someone in your lineage of your line of descent who is going to be born 500 years from now? Or how about 700 years from now? Just three, and I don't mean general, I mean specific. Specific things that you believe you could foretell about someone in your lineage who's going to be born 700 years from now. How about 1,100 years from now? But that's what the Bible does. 500 years, 700 years, 1,100 years before the birth of Christ, foretelling about His birth. What are the odds that someone could be born to fulfill those prophecies? Peter Stoner, in his book, Science Speaks, um, he's, a, he's a mathematician who chose just eight prophecies of the Old Testament and then calculated the odds of one person being able to fulfill just eight prophecies in their proper order in the way that we find them presented in the Old Testament and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The statistical odds of that happening are one and 100 quadrillion. That's a number that we can't even imagine. It's a number that has 17 zeros behind it. That's a lot of zeros, folks. I would, I would like just to have a few of them in my bank account, I think. <laughs> You know, I won't get greedy. I won't ask for 17, but what, what does that mean? To put it in terms that you can understand, if you were to take silver dollars and put them on the state of Texas and stack them up, it would cover the state of Texas two foot deep. And then you have a person blindfolded and send them out into the state of Texas to sift blindfolded through all of those silver dollars and pick one that you had painted a different color. The odds of them finding that one silver dollar blindfolded across the state of Texas is about the same as the odds of one person being born into the human race that can fulfill eight prophecies the way they foretold in the Old Testament. But listen, Jesus Christ didn't just fulfill eight prophecies. Jesus Christ fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies. What are the odds of that, folks? The odds of that are so astronomical that statistics has no number for it. But Jesus Christ did it. Did I mention prophecies? I won't put it up a third time. But the Bible is impressive in the way that it foreshadows, that it points us to, that it prepares us for the coming of the Savior and then does it. There's a story of a little girl in Sunday school class. They were, the teacher gave them some time because the pastor was going over I don't know any churches where that happens, but um, the pastor was going over, so she just let the kids, you know, color until the pastor was done to dismiss church. And uh, there was this girl drawing, and so she asked the little girl, what are you drawing? And she said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the Sunday school teacher said, honey, no one knows what God looks like. And she confidently said, well, they're going to in a few minutes. <laughs> The Old Testament prophecies looked for the Savior with excited expectation and prepared us for His arrival. The prophets pointed us to Him 
to Jesus as the Christ, as the fulfillment of all of those Old Testament prophecies. All throughout the Old Testament, we get glimpses of his coming. Prophecies that make it clear who he was so they would recognize him when he came. And so what's the point this morning? The point is, Jesus Christ is the real deal. Jesus Christ really is the Son of God. Jesus Christ really is the Savior. Jesus Christ really is the only way to get to heaven. We can rejoice in that He is the fulfillment of God's promise of a Savior. So considering all of those Old Testament prophecies about Jesus Christ, what does it mean for us today? We, we've shared a lot of verses, and it's not just for us just to you know, have a knowledge of the Word of God. That's good, but the knowledge, you see, requires a response. I, I beg you that your first response today is to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. To believe what God has said and what the prophets foretold and that Jesus Christ really is the Messiah. And then believing that, what can we do? We can stand. We can stand firm in the truth of the Word of God. God is true and God's Word is truth. No matter what public opinion says, no matter what you hear in the world around us today, no matter what they may teach in science class about mankind being evolved from monkeys and one-celled organisms, that's not how it happened. God's Word tells us how it happened. We are created in the image and in the likeness of God. The breath of God was breathed into us. God created the earth and everything in it, and it's as simple as that. He created us as well. When God says life is precious, it is. When God says that something is a sin, guess what? It is. But when God says that He will save us in spite of those sins, He will. When God says great things await us after this earthly journey, you can take it to the bank that it is waiting for. Merry Christmas to you from God. Don't doubt, don't question, don't disregard the Word of God. Stand firm. All these prophecies about the Christ have either already been fulfilled, as in over 300 of them, or they will be fulfilled in the coming days. That I believe is approaching us quicker and quicker. The last days. No prophecy that was supposed to be fulfilled yet has missed the mark. Everyone has come true so far. We can rely on God's Word. So stand firm in your faith, knowing that God's Word is true. And next, we can hope. We can stand and we can have hope. No matter how bad things get, God has a timetable and it's being worked out perfectly and nothing is taking him by surprise. If God can so accurately predict the details about the Savior who would be born hundreds of years before he was born, then he cares about the little details of our lives as well, and he will be there with us to help us through as he works out his plan and purpose, not only in the world, but also in our own lives. As we read the prophecies of the promise of Scripture, let us have the hope that we are to have and trust in the finished work of God. And next, anticipate. Anticipate with joy what God has in store for us. I mean, not just the hope of knowing that it's there, but really excitedly anticipate it like a child on Christmas morning rushing down to open the presents. What is it that God has waiting for us? It is marvelous. It's majestic. It's fantastic. When we read through the prophecies and the promises, we get glimpses of what awaits us. But every glimpse should cause us to be all the more excited about what God has for us. And we should anticipate it with joy. 
And finally, prepare. There's preparation. It's where I started this morning. We were talking about preparation. And there is still preparation for us. When we see that the scriptures are true, when we see that Jesus Christ really is Lord and Savior, and we know that we will stand before him one day and give account of our lives, then we ought to live lives that are pleasing to him. Holy lives. Godly lives. Many people today, even Christians, live as though that event is not going to take place, but the scriptures are very clear that it will. We will each one stand before the Lord. Now, after you've accepted Jesus Christ as your salvation, you won't stand before him as a question of your salvation. Your salvation is sure. You can have assurance once you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. But what you will stand before him to answer for is what you've done with the knowledge that he really does exist. What you've done with the knowledge of Jesus Christ as your Savior. How did you live your life after that? Understanding that this present earthly life is simply preparation for eternity. So that one day when we do stand before him, we can hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Which will mean that you put in the preparation necessary to hear those words. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for who you are, for your love and your mercy that showers your grace upon us. We thank you, Father, for sending your Son to the cross of Calvary to rescue us from our sin. In response to that knowledge, I, I pray that if anyone is listening who has not accepted that rescue, the plan of salvation through the shed blood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I just pray that they do this morning. Pray, Father, I pray that they acknowledge that they understand that they are sinners, that there is no way that we in our own merit can gain acceptance into heaven, but that you have made it possible one way and one way only, and that is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And I pray, Father, that for those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, that in response and in, in preparation for our, our certain home in eternity that you have provided for us, that we are like David, a man after your own heart who prayed in uh, the book of Psalm chapter 139 that you would search us and try us, O God, and know our heart and test us and our anxious thoughts and see if there's any offensive way in us and lead us in the true way of life everlasting. Father, we just... Pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.